Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's video. Today we're gonna be talking about what happened to 13 year old Rachel Mellon Skemp. My goal with this video is to help spread awareness and keep Rachel's memory and name alive. I'm pretty sure you guys are gonna leave the video feeling very frustrated. That's literally how I felt while I was researching this case. I literally was like, are you kidding me? Like how are the police just like not doing anything? It's just very frustrating and there's just so much information to go over but yeah that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about in today's video if you guys are new here welcome bienvenidos hopefully you guys can join the familia by clicking the subscribe button down below i also have a true crime tiktok if you guys didn't know i basically summarize my videos here over on tiktok so if you guys ever want to watch a recap you guys can head over to tiktok at true crime jackie and yeah let's jump right into today's video Rachel Marie Mellon Scamp was born on Tuesday, October 13th, 1982. Her parents are Jeff Scamp and Amy Mellon, and she was born on Melrose Park, Illinois. When she was three years old, her parents actually got a divorce and her father Jeff moved to Texas while Amy stayed in Illinois with Rachel. Soon after the divorce, Amy began dating a man named Vincent Mellon. They eventually got married and had two more children, Jason in 1988 and Ashley in 1990. Together, the Mellon family lived in Bolingbrook, Illinois, which is about 30 miles outside of Chicago. Although Jeff lived in Dallas, he was still active in his daughter's life and Rachel would often go visit him in Texas. He loved his daughter and wanted to make sure she was doing okay after the divorce and with her new stepfather Vincent. So he would often ask her about how her life at home was going and Rachel told him that everything was fine and that everyone was getting along well. Rachel attended Ward Middle School where she was an honor student and her favorite subject in school was science. Friends and family of Rachel describe her as a bubbly person with a great sense of humor. She always managed to stay positive, she was the life of the party, and was always the most beautiful girl in the room. She was goofy, joyful, always singing and dancing, and just making people laugh. Both of her parents were youth leaders at the First Baptist Church, and Rachel quickly became the mascot of the youth group. She was also into recycling and nature and eventually planned on becoming a school teacher. Although Rachel had a cheerful and bubbly personality, things at home weren't always going well. In 1990, when she was just 8 years old, her mom Amy and her stepfather Vincent got into a physical fight. Amy ended up filing a police report against Vincent and she also filed a restraining order against him. He had hit her, pushed her down the stairs, and made verbal threats against Amy and Rachel but she eventually dropped all the charges against him and they ended up getting back together. Then, five years after this incident, Rachel actually ran away from home. She left a note explaining that she was running away because she feared that she would be blamed for something that her siblings broke. So she ran away to a friend's house, she slept outside the house of that friend, and then eventually called her grandparents to come pick her up after she had been gone for 12 hours. Honestly, just hearing this makes me very upset and emotional because I feel like Rachel was going through so much. I mean, I'm sure it must have been traumatizing to see your mom and your stepfather get into a physical fight. You know, to see your mom get pushed down the stairs and hit and, you know, be threatened. And then they just get back together. And then you have to go on as one big happy family and act as if nothing ever happened. That must have taken a toll on Rachel and you know the fact that she felt like she needed to run away because she was scared she would get in trouble for something that she didn't even do. I just feel like Rachel must have been going through a lot at home. In the summer of 1995, Rachel went to go stay in Dallas, Texas with her father Jeff for over a month. While she was there, she literally begged her uncle to help her move to Dallas. She told him that she felt like she would be better off living with her dad than living with her mom. But unfortunately, that move wasn't able to happen and Rachel had to go back home to Illinois with her mom. 
Fast forward to Tuesday, January 30th, 1996. 13-year-old Rachel was at school having a pretty normal day. However, as the day moved along, her friends noticed that she was crying by her locker, which they thought was very strange because like I mentioned earlier, she always had a smile on her face, she was always positive and always seemed happy. So her friends decided to approach her and they asked her what was wrong. Rachel told them that she had a problem but that she would take take care of it herself. She didn't really say anything else. You know, she didn't really elaborate as to what problem she was having. She just told her friends this information and then everyone went about their day. The following morning on Wednesday, January 31st, Rachel decided to stay home from school because she had a sore throat and she felt sick. Her mother Amy told her that this was fine and then she left for work early in the morning, leaving Rachel in the hands of her stepfather Vincent. Now he was unemployed at the time so he was able to stay home all day watching Rachel and making sure she was taken care of. At around 10.45 that morning, Rachel calls her paternal grandmother Lucy and thanks her for the Christmas presents she had sent. This phone call lasted around 4 to 5 minutes. It was just a quick call catching up. Lucy says that nothing seemed out of the ordinary until she noticed that Rachel suddenly got quiet. So she asked Rachel, is he there? Referring to Vincent and Rachel said yes. Then she told her grandmother that she needed to hang up the phone. After this phone call with her grandma, Vincent says that he and Rachel were just playing Nintendo for a couple of hours and then she decided she was going to take a nap in her bed. As she was napping, Vincent decided to take the family dog Duke on a walk. Now it was around 20 degrees below zero. It was literally freezing cold outside. It was definitely not the ideal weather for someone to go outside and take their dog on a walk. But that's what Vincent wanted to do. So he left the house and as they were going along their walk, Vincent says that the dog broke free of its collar after it began chasing a rabbit. Now he says that he tried to go chase after the dog, he tried to get him back and you know reattach the collar, but then he decided to just give up and head back home. He figured that the dog would be fine and that he would eventually find his way back home. He left at around 2.30 p.m. and he only expected to be out for a couple of minutes. You know he was just going to do a quick walk with the dog, but since the dog had broken free from its collar and was running around chasing a rabbit, this made his quick walk turn into a 30 minute walk. So by the time he got home, it was already around 3 p.m. 15 minutes after Vincent arrived home, his youngest daughter Ashley, who was only 6 years old at the time, finally arrived home from school. She says that as soon as she got home, she ran into her big sister Rachel's room to say hi, but when she walked in, she realized that her sister wasn't there. She went to go tell Vincent that Rachel wasn't in her room, but apparently he didn't do anything about it. Then an hour later at around 4.30 p.m., a real estate broker found Duke and brought him back home with the help of a neighbor. Then 30 minutes after that, Amy and her youngest son, Jason, arrived home at 5 p.m. When they got home, Ashley told her mother that Rachel wasn't in her room and that she was gone. This is when Amy began to worry and started calling all of Rachel's friends to see if anyone had seen her, but no one had. After this, she decided to call 911 and report her daughter as missing. Amy says that it took the Bolingbroke Police Department over an hour to arrive to her house. When they got there, they didn't really think that she was missing. They kind of just assumed that she was a runaway and that she would be back home in a couple of hours. Maybe police thought this because she had previously ran away from home for 12 hours, so they didn't really take her disappearance seriously. They didn't search the house, they didn't speak to any of the neighbors, they didn't try to find any type of evidence. They also believed that maybe Rachel had gone to visit her dad in Texas, maybe she had gone to stay with other family and she just didn't tell her parents parents about this but then they checked if she had purchased any bus tickets or any plane tickets and since she had it now they started to believe that maybe she didn't run away and that maybe she had been abducted. So the following day police show back up at the Mellon house and now they begin to thoroughly investigate the scene. They searched the house, they searched the surrounding areas but found no sign of Rachel. Vincent says that the last time he saw Rachel she was taking a nap in her bedroom and was wrapped in a blue blanket. She was wearing yellow sweatpants, a pink top, and red house slippers. When police searched her bedroom, two pillows from her bed and the blue blanket she was wrapped in were missing. 
However, all of her winter clothes, her shoes, and her coats were still there. They also found her purse with all of her belongings and her Walkman. It also didn't seem as if there had been some type of struggle in her room. Everything was pretty much in order. Now, Vincent says that when he went to walk the dog, he left the front door unlocked. So if someone did come inside to a Ducked Rachel. They could have easily just walked strange, and it just seemed like Rachel had vanished into thin air. Police searched the house. They searched the surrounding ground, air, and areas of water using geothermal imaging and drones, but nothing was found. A few of Rachel's friends gathered to search around the neighborhood. They checked the local park. They were walking up and down the street. One of Rachel's best friends, Carrie, says that at one point, all the friends huddled together and began crying because because they realized that there was no sign of their friend. Which is just very heartbreaking. I mean, the day before she disappeared, they had seen Rachel crying in front of her locker, saying that she had a problem, and now she was missing. I just can't imagine what was going through their mind and how stressful the situation must have been. So when Jeff received the phone call letting him know that Rachel was missing, he immediately dropped everything and flew to Illinois to begin searching for his daughter. When he arrived to the Mellon house, he immediately walked into his daughter's bedroom and just laid on her bed. He says that he was in complete shock and just couldn't believe that his little girl was missing. He says when he saw Rachel's Walkman, he put on her headphones and began listening to her favorite music. He did speak to Vincent and was pretty much like, hey what happened and vincent replied saying that someone must have snatched her while he was out walking the dog when you when you first went back when you heard your daughter was missing did you have a conversation with the last person to see her alive her stepfather vincent mellon uh yeah i spent most of that weekend actually at their house we passed out flyers we uh uh went for walks uh that's uh, there was a lot of remote area close to our house. We walked through the through the brush and uh, what did uh, Vincent Mellon tell you? Weekend. What did he tell you when you said to him, my daughter went missing on your watch? What happened to her? He says, I don't know what happened. He says, I, I was out. And uh, when I came back, she was gone. He said, somebody's come came in and snatched her. And uh, I. You know, at that point, you know, I really didn't know a lot of the facts and didn't know a lot of a lot of things. So I basically took him at his word. Now, Jeff, as well as the police, noticed that Vincent had some scratches on his arm. When he was asked about this, he said that he got those scratches while he was working on his car. But honestly, police suspected of Vincent from the start and they believed that foul play was involved. One of the reasons why they believe this is because when they were searching Rachel's bedroom, they found her diary. And what they found written inside her diary is honestly just very heartbreaking. I am just going to put a little trigger warning out there because what I'm about to say is disturbing. So inside her diary, police found an entry from August 7th, 1995. In this entry, Rachel wrote about how her stepfather Vincent had kissed her and touched her inappropriately. He told her he was doing this to teach her a lesson, to warn her about predators, and to show her what shouldn't be done to her until she's older. Along with the diary, police also found a book called Daddy's Kiss. Now, I've read some conflicting reports about what this book is about. Some reports say that this is a children's book about, you know, giving love to your dad and about, you know, a loving relationship between a dad and a child. However, other reports state that this book talks about incest. So I'm not not really sure which of the two it is. Along with the book and the diary, police also found a steak knife hidden underneath Rachel's bed. Their journal entry is just so upsetting. I can't imagine what Rachel's family must have felt when they heard this entry. It's just really sad. So when police found this journal entry, their suspicions about Vincent immediately grew. Now there was going to be an episode about Rachel's disappearance on America's Most Wanted. I did everything I could to find the episode but I don't think they actually went through with it. However, when they were talking about doing this show, this sparked new interest into Rachel's investigation 
Vincent and put the spotlight back on Vincent. In January of 2000, police obtained a warrant to get blood, semen, saliva, and hair samples from Vincent to present in front of a grand jury. They did question him at the start of the investigation, but he invoked his Fifth Amendment, so they weren't able to get much information out of him. They did eventually conduct a lie detector test on both Amy and Vincent. Amy did pass her lie detector test, but Vincent failed his. Now, they haven't revealed why he failed the test or what specific questions he failed, and I know that lie detector tests aren't always accurate and they can't be used in court, but the fact that he failed the polygraph test just made police even more suspicious of him. And honestly, I get why they're suspicious of him. I mean, he was the last person to see Rachel. He says that he went on a walk in freezing cold weather. He had scratches all over his arms that he says he got from working on a car. Then police find that diary entry from Rachel saying that her stepfather kissed her and touched her inappropriately. Then he fails a polygraph test and on top of that, he has a history of domestic violence. There's just a lot of information stacked up against Vincent, so they did present him to a grand jury, but unfortunately, the investigation ended without any indictments. There were no arrests against Vincent, no charges made against him, nothing. He has done a couple of interviews talking about Rachel's disappearance, and he says that he hopes whoever took Rachel will bring her home. I did read a statement from Amy where she said that she believes her daughter is still alive and that someone out there knows where she is. So how are you coping with this? What's, how, how are you getting by through all this? A uh, little bit of everything. <laughs> Devastation, frustration, not learning, not knowing where she's at, not knowing anything. We had asked to have them put it out as a you know, missing report right away as opposed to just a runaway because someone doesn't run away with uh, no coat and shoes in the wintertime. To anyone who knows where Rachel is or what happened to her, please come forward and help this parent bring closure to this tragedy. In March of 2001, Amy claimed that Rachel called her phone three separate times, all within three minutes, but this has never been proven. To this day, in August of 2022, Rachel has still not been found and no one has ever been charged in her disappearance. Now, Jeff says that he has always been skeptical about Vincent's explanation of what happened that night. He says, I hold out very little hope that Rachel is still alive, but I still hold out maybe a half percent. I still occasionally daydream about the day Rachel would come home, even though realistically, I'm pretty sure it's going to never happen. Whoever did this, and I have my suspicions about what happened, did a really good job of covering. He also says that he can't really criticize the police, but he does believe that they missed the opportunity to find Rachel's body. He believes that if they had searched the garage the night Rachel disappeared and opened the trunk of the car inside, they would have found Rachel's body right then and there. Talked to Rachel's father, and they also spoke to the private investigator in charge of the case named Cindy. On the show, Cindy said that she did speak to Ashley and Jason about what happened the day that their sister disappeared, and they both said that their father was working in the garage the entire night. So maybe Jeff is right. You know, maybe if the police had checked the garage and they had thoroughly investigated the car, they could have possibly found something. The I-Team, which is an investigative group, has been investigating the disappearance of Rachel for over 20 years. They spoke with a retired police chief named Bill who has solved several cold cases in his career. He said that sooner or later, time and guilt catch up with people. Maybe it's a family member that knew something and decided not to tell because they were trying to protect someone. Maybe it's the individual who is responsible for the, for the disappearance themselves and they'll finally realize that they're getting down near the end of the road and that they want to make peace. He says that somewhere there will be a break in the case and hopefully that does happen. It's been over 20 years since Rachel was last seen and there really hasn't been any new movement in her case. So on January 28, 2006, Jeff held a memorial service for Rachel where he invited her friends and family to gather, share stories about Rachel, and to just grieve. He said, It warms my soul. I'm glad I believe in God because ultimately justice is waiting. He said that the first few years after Rachel disappeared were just completely unbearable and now that so many years have passed, it's still very hard to cope with. 
He believes that somebody out there knows something. That's why he's trying to keep Rachel's name out there because it's important. Someday, somebody is going to remember something that can help find Rachel and they're going to have a good conscience, tell the police, and help bring Rachel home. He said that a few years ago, he was buying groceries with his grandson when his grandson noticed a bench nearby. Now, his grandson has never met Rachel and doesn't really know much about what happened to her, but he says that he began tugging on his shirt and said, Papa, there's my auntie. So when Jeff turned around and saw that there was a bench near the checkout line with a photo of his daughter, he just felt so emotional and just felt so happy and warm. He felt like Rachel was there with him and his grandson watching them pack up their groceries. It also made him feel very happy to know that after so many years, people still care about his daughter and are still trying to find her. Now, the reason that Rachel's face is on this bench is because she's a part of the program called Sitting with an Angel. This is a program where advertisers sponsor benches and post information about missing children. These benches are placed inside or in front of high traffic establishments such as grocery stores so that as many people as possible can see this information. I mean, what a wonderful and strong program. I will definitely be making a donation to them because I think what they're doing is just so influential and just so amazing. You never know who may come across these benches, so the fact that they're putting these benches out there and helping to spread awareness on these missing people is just amazing. So another way that people are remembering Rachel is through a dedicated tree at Whipfler Park in Bolingbrook. This tree was planted on May 25th, 2001 and was planted right across the street from where Rachel lived. Along with the tree, they also planted a time capsule in Rachel's memory and filled the capsule with items that she loved. This tree is called Rachel's Tree and it's a place where her friends and family can go to remember her. One of Rachel's best friends that I mentioned earlier, Carrie, has been doing whatever she can to keep her friend's memory alive. She created a Facebook page in Rachel's honor where she posts updates about her disappearance, photos, and any other helpful information. She says that it's important to keep Rachel's name out there and that she won't give up on finding her friend. She says that even the littlest of information could lead to big answers. So she urges anyone with information to please come forward and say something. Don't let Rachel's family and friends continue to suffer. Just come forward and give the police this information. As for Amy and Vincent, they eventually left Illinois and moved to Tennessee. The phone numbers everyone had for them are no longer working. The numbers are either disconnected or they're just not answering anyone's calls. According to Jeff, they also aren't cooperating with police. I read somewhere that they did move back to Illinois, but I'm not sure if that's 100% true. But regardless, they aren't participating in any searches for Rachel. They aren't posting about Rachel in the Facebook group. They're not doing any public interviews speaking about Rachel. Now, Jeff says that he doesn't really understand why. Like, why would Vincent want to be uncooperative with the police? Is it because he's hiding something? As for Rachel's mother, Amy, he's also just as confused as to why she wouldn't want to find her daughter. Jeff feels like Amy is just trying to sweep Rachel's disappearance under the rug and forget about it. Jeff literally quit his job in Dallas and moved to Illinois to search for his daughter and instead of joining him, his ex-wife Amy just moved away. He says that if there ever is a big break in the case, no one will be able to reach Amy to let her know because her number doesn't work anymore. He remembers that after Vincent and Amy took the the polygraph test and Vincent came back and said he failed, he heard Vincent tell Amy that they're no longer going to cooperate with the police. So I don't know, maybe Amy does want to help the police, maybe she does want to find her daughter, but you know, she's scared. I know that it's hard to leave abusive relationships and maybe that's what's going on. I also wonder if police thoroughly investigated what Rachel had written in her diary about Vincent. I mean, she literally said that Vincent had kissed her and touched her inappropriately. So I hope that police did look into that. And a lot of people criticize Amy for staying with Vincent after hearing that your daughter was abused by him. Some people wonder if that's the problem that Rachel was referring to at school when she was talking to her friends. You know, maybe the problem was that she was being abused by her stepfather and when she told her friends that she was going to deal with it, maybe she planned on finally telling someone the truth.
Now, there was an episode on Case Files Chicago about Rachel's disappearance, which I will link down below. But in the episode, you can hear from Carrie, Rachel's best friend, as well as hear from her father. It was a really good and informative show, so I definitely recommend you guys check it out. There's also a website called rachelfine.com that I believe is run by her father. On this website, you can read about who Rachel was as a person, learn about how you can help find Rachel, how to remember her, and where you can follow them on social media to stay updated. It's a really beautiful website, so I definitely recommend you guys take a look at it. You can also download a flyer through the website and post it on social media so you can help spread awareness. Jeff says that he isn't accepting any donations, but if you would like to make a donation in Rachel's name, he asks that you please send the donation directly to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. He says that if his daughter were around today, amid the pandemic, she would be on the front lines fighting against racial injustice, social injustice, police corruption, and doing everything within her power to help those who are struggling. Jeff says all he wants to see is justice for his daughter in the form of an arrest and conviction for Rachel's abductor and likely killer. His daughter only lives in his heart now and he knows that she's in a better place and is no longer suffering. Although this case is over 20 years old, the Bolingbroke Police Department says that it's still active and they are still searching for Rachel. There is a $10,000 reward from Crime Stoppers for any information leading to Rachel's whereabouts. If you know anything, please contact the Bolingbroke Police Department at 630-226-0600. You can also contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 18 The Lost or submit a tip through their website. If you are afraid to contact the police, you can also contact Rachel's private detective here. Rachel would be 39 years old today. She was just a child, a baby when she disappeared and so many years have gone by without any answers and without any justice. She deserves to be found and like I said, I hope by making this video I can continue to spread awareness on Rachel's disappearance and keep her memory and name alive. Rachel was a beautiful and loving girl that had her entire life ahead of her. She deserves justice and I pray that she gets it. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. I know it's very frustrating and I wish there was some type of closure and answer for the family. I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this down below. Please make sure to share Rachel's photo on social media, share her flyer, share her story, and just keep her name alive. All right, you guys, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.